chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and one, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would go in peace in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would sing and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would sin and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Thank you, God, for bringing us here together, that we may be here in Clovis or digitally or wherever we may be at. Thank you, God, for bringing us here to this first this first Sunday in the new year. A lot of people didn't make it, but we are all still here to tell the story and know that you are blessing us despite everything that's going on in the world. In Jesus' name, I pray, man.
know it was the blood that saved us. Lord God, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for the songs that have been said, the prayers that have been offered, the scriptures that have been read. Father, we thank you that you brought us to this first Sunday of a brand new year. Lord, you have kept us, you have saved us, you have redeemed us, you have delivered us, and you have covered us. So the Lord, we, today we give you our highest praise. We humble ourselves in your presence, that you alone may be glorified in this moment. Your people will see none of me but all of you, that you alone may be exalted. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, the preparation that has gone and the presentation that will be delivered, let it all be done pleasing and acceptable into your sight, our strength and our redeemer. The Lord's people said, Amen. Amen. Grab your copy of God's Word wherever you are and turn back with us to the book of Job. We want to reread what Deacon McCann has already read to set a setting for our time of worship in the Word. Job chapter 1, beginning at verse number 1. There the Word of God says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, Thus Job did regularly. Amen. You may have your seat in the presence of God. If you're standing in your home, you may have your seat in the presence of God. Uh, amen. I want to label the message today covering our families in prayer. Covering our families in in prayer. As we begin this new year, I want to begin with a sermon series that is titled God's Family Praise. Because if we are a part of God's family, there are certain things that God's family does. God's family serves. God's family gives. God's family loves. The most important and most vital is that God's family prays. And as we launch into the unknown sea of a new year, I believe that it is imperative that we start in the right way and in the right frame of mind. Last year tried us, last year tested us, and it twisted us in every imaginable way. And the truth be told, it has left us scarred and it has left us a little bit scared. And that's why we spent this week as a church family in consecration and praying and fasting, seeking the presence, the power, the purpose, and the provisions of God. For there is no better way to begin and set the foundation for the year ahead 
than to pray. Prayer is essential. Prayer is vital. Prayer is indispensable. And we should not expect the blessing of God if we are unwilling to humble ourselves in prayer. Mm -hmm. right. Our prosperity in God is tied to our commitment to pray. With this truth in mind, as a church family, we will begin this year embracing the blessings and benefits of a praying family. Mm -hmm. The text before us today is a familiar text, but we don't normally use it to begin the year. This is not a familiar first Sunday type of text, but God has led us to this text at the beginning of this year to talk about this man by the name of Job. Because Job was a godly man who understood the importance of covering his family with prayer. And I want to impress upon us not just this day, but every day, that prayer is the most important thing that we can do for our family. We can do a whole lot of things. There are a whole lot of important things that we need to do. We need to educate our children. We need to be responsible financially. We need to protect our children and, and protect our rights. There are a lot of things that we need to do for our families. But the most important thing that we can do for our families is cover them in prayer to present our families before the Lord in prayer. Job was a man from the land of us. Historians tell us that Uz was a region east of Judah in what is known as Northern Arabia. Job was described as a man who was righteous in character and in conduct. The Bible says he was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned the evil. Not only was Job righteous, but Job was also rich. The Bible said he had many possessions. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. The Bible says that Job was the greatest of all people of the East. Job had possessions. Job had property. But Job also had posterity. Job had sons and daughters. He had seven sons and three daughters. Job had everything that a man could want and more. But let me pause and say that Job was not considered righteous because he was rich. I want to argue that Job was rich because Job was righteous. Don't get me wrong, I'm not promoting a false prosperity gospel that says that when we get saved, we automatically get rich. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, what I am saying, though, is that when we are faithful to God, God is faithful to us. When we bless God, God knows how to bless us. Matthew 6 and 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. The righteousness of God is more than things, but God knows how to bless his people with things. Yes. Job was a man of God, and he was the spiritual leader of his family. Job was the priest of his home. Bible says that his sons and daughters had a tendency to do what young people did. Y'all don't hear me. He said that they had a tendency to do what young people did. The Bible said that Job's children liked to party. Yeah, amen. Y'all don't know how to read the Bible. The Bible says that his sons would go and feast in their houses each on his appointed day and would sin and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. They were having house parties in their houses. 
They did it with young folks. Did it. Like some of y'all don't sit there and shake your head at me because when you were younger, you had your share and your time in your own house parties. Yeah. But Job faithfully covered his family in prayer. And that's where I'm going to hang my hat this morning because Job's willingness, desire, and urgency to cover his family in prayer. With all that's going on in the world, with diseases that we can't see, with overt racism that we can see, with uncertainty and instability, the question is this morning, are we faithfully covering our families in prayer? Are we praying for our spouses? Are we praying for our children? Are we praying for our loved ones? Are we praying for our church family? Are we covering our families in prayer? I submit to us today that we've abdicated and abandoned our responsibility as leaders and parents and spouses and children and brothers and sisters in Christ if we are not covering our families in prayer. So today, as we consider Job's life, let us be challenged to constantly and consistently cover our families in prayer. The question I want to pose and answer today in the time that is ours is this. What led Job to cover his family in prayer? I want to say and suggest that first of all, Job covered his family in prayer because Job knew God. Job covered his family in prayer because Job knew God. Job's personal description tells us about his relationship with God. In fact, the entire book of Job is about his relationship with God. He was an upright man who had an upright relationship with God. Job knew that he could pray to God because Job already knew God. Yes. Prayer is born out of relationship. Yes. Now listen, we can pray sinners' prayers. I pray that all of us have at one time prayed the sinner's prayer where we cry out to God from our sin and he hears and saves. In fact, you can't be saved unless you humble yourself before God and cry out to him from a place of your sin saying, Father, save me. But we know that the most effective prayer is a prayer that's born out of relationship. That's so why Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. This word, our Father, that phrase, our Father, denotes relationship because the characteristics used to describe Job meant that he had a connection with God. Prayer is always better when you know who you're talking to. Listen, if you're going to ask somebody for something, it's best to know the person you're asking. I know a whole lot of folks. I have connections with a whole lot of folks. I have some things, some people that I know, but I don't know them well enough to just pick up the phone and ask for stuff. But Job knew God well enough that when his children did what they did, Job could go to God on behalf of his entire James chapter 5 verse 16 says the effectual fervent prayer, the earnest sincere prayer of the righteous, the redeemed, and the saved avails much. If you really want to cover your family in prayer, you need to get to know the prayer answering God. Job covered his family in prayer and because he knew God. But then Job covered his family in prayer because Job knew sin. Uh, after Job's children had their parties, verse 5 said that he would sin and sanctify them. and He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number 
of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Job covered his family in prayer because Job understood the human sin nature. I'll say that again. Job covered his family in prayer because Job understood the human sin nature. Job understood that in the midst of their fun and frivolity, that it is likely that his children did something that displeased God. Job knew that his children had, watch this, the potential to sin. Uh, child of God, let me help some parent here this morning. Uh, child, I know that your baby ain't never did nothing wrong. I know your baby ain't never said a bad word. I know your baby is an angel, but your baby got the potential to sin. Job knew that his children had the potential to sin because Job knew he had the potential to sin. And Job understood that whatever was in him was also in them. I, I really can't get mad at my sons when they do things that they're not supposed to do because they got my DNA coursing through their veins and, and, and what was in me is also in them. So there's some moments where they're going to make some mistakes because they got the genetic makeup of their father and all of us have the potential and tendency to sin because we have the genetic makeup of our father Adam and Job knew that when his sons and daughters got together, there may not have been no Bible study. There may not have been a prayer meeting. So Job said, let me go to God on behalf of my children because they might have sinned against God in their heart. Job knew and understood sin in his children because Job knew and understood sin in his own life. Bible says that Job was blameless, but he wasn't sinless. Job was upright, but he wasn't perfect. Job knew his own sin, his own tendencies, his own proclivities, his own habits, his own internal struggles. He knew that if sin plagued him, even though he walked with God, then sin most certainly haunted his own family. And when you know that sin is haunting your family, you need to cover them in prayer. I know what's waiting on my children. I, I know what's haunting my wife. I know that Satan is after my family. So it's my job as the priest of my home to keep my family covered in prayer. Job didn't just give his family over to sin. Job didn't just Give his family over to Satan. Job kept praying and sanctifying and he kept offering sacrifices to God on their behalf. But can I encourage somebody this morning? Job kept praying and his children kept partying. Y'all y'all missed that. Job, Brother Mo, kept praying and his children kept on. Right. The Bible said that Job would pray, his children would party, he would pray again, and they would still party. Y'all ain't hear me here this morning. There's some parent this morning, some child, some brother, some sister, you've been praying for somebody, and it seems that as long as you pray, they keep doing what they've been doing. But child of God, I want to encourage you, you can't control what everybody does, but you can't keep praying for them. Yeah. Go pray, and his children will have another party. He said and sanctify them, pray over them, and they still have another party. You would think by now they would understand that their daddy was trying to tell them something. But listen, they were just like the rest of us. It didn't matter what somebody did. I'm still going to do whatever I want to do. You can't control everything that your family does. 
You can't, can't be everywhere all the time. You can't control everything they will face, but you can cover them in prayer. Because what you don't know, God knows. And what you can't control, God controls. And where you can't be, God is already there. So we keep covering our families in prayer because we know sin and we know Satan is out there waiting on them. But we know that God is wherever our families are. Job covered his family in prayer because he knew God. He covered his family in prayer because he knew sin. Lastly, Job covered his family in prayer because God New Job. The last four words of verse 5 are imperative to our prayer life. They simply say this, thus Job did regularly. What powerful words those are that, that Job prayed regularly. Job was a regular customer at the prayer bank. He was no stranger to God's throne of grace. This was no sporadic attempt to placate God. No, prayer was a regular occurrence for Job. So when God, when Job went to God in prayer for his family, God recognized his voice. One of the greatest things ever invented was call ID. <laughs> call ID gives us the ability to preview a call as it comes. And as it calls in, we are able to see who's calling. And based on the information on the screen, we get to decide whether or not we want to answer. Here's the thing, child of God, when your name comes up on God's call ID, it's good to know that he knows the name that he said. Because when I see unavailable on my call ID, I'm unavailable to you too. You don't want your name to show up as unavailable or unknown on God's call ID. Because it's one thing to say we know God, but it's something totally different when God knows your name. God is greater than anything and anybody. And it's one thing to say I know the Lord, but it's something else when you can say that Lord knows my name. God knew Job so well. That when Satan showed up in heaven and was looking for someone to test, God said, have you considered my servant Job? He said he did. he's the greatest. There is none like him on earth. God knew Job so well that he offered him up to be tested by God. Can the same be said to you this morning? Does God know you well enough that he can see a test your way and he knows that you'll pass the test? Does Saved 
by Jesus. And I'm almost done, but let me just pose here that Job interceded for his family because God knew him. Listen, all of us have a testimony of someone praying for us yes. when we couldn't or when we wouldn't pray for ourselves. We've all had somebody in our life that we said could get a prayer for us. We've all had somebody in our life that, that, that prayed even though it didn't look like things were going to change. We had that somebody in our lives that prayed so well that when they started praying, the activities of heaven paused for a moment. And the angels stood at the banister of heaven and looked over to see who was praying. And God said, now I know that voice. That's grandma praying for her grandchild. Thank God I had a praying mother. Thank God I still have a praying mother, but when it looked like I was going nowhere and it looked like I would be nothing, my mama just kept on praying. If it had not been for her prayer, I know I wouldn't have made it, but God knew her so well that he answered her prayer for me. And here I am today, the answer to my mama's prayer. But at some point in time, you got to learn how to pray for yourself. At some point in time, you got to get to know him for yourself. Because mama and daddy and grandma and grandpa, aunties and uncle can cover you in prayer. But they can't save you. And if you're going to get to heaven, if you're going to make it in this life, you got to get to know him for yourself. Yes. Then you got to get to be known for him, for yourself. The conclusion of this portion of Job's story is somewhat anticlimactic. In fact, it's somewhat disheartening. Because after all of his praying, Job lost all ten of his children. All of them died in one violent storm. Job prayed for them, help me here, Holy Spirit, and he still lost them. And I can't explain why even though Job covered his family in prayer, tragedy still struck. I can't understand why God would allow this to happen even though Job had been faithful. I, I, I can't tell you why tragedy and calamity hit Job. I, I can't tell you. I, I don't know the answer, but I know that God is sovereign. Yeah. And sometimes he does things that we may never understand. Job covered his children in prayer. And one day he got the news. Job, all of those kids you've been praying for are gone. Everything that you work for, Job, is gone. Everything that you accumulated, everything that you had, Job, is all gone. But wait a minute, Lord. I've been praying. I've been fresh. I've been fasting. I, I've been sacrificing. I've been off now. I've been doing the right thing. Job kept on praying. 
when his friends doubted, Job kept on praying. Job prayed for 42 chapters. And after 42 chapters of sickness, 42 chapters of loss, 42 chapters of ridicule, 42 chapters of accusation, God turned that thing around for Job. Because Job chapter 42 and 12 said the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning. Make it. 
did. The numbers just kept going up. But God kept covering us. People kept on dying. But God kept covering us. We lost some folks. But God kept on covering us. Is there anybody here today who knows that you can celebrate us? Pray. 
parents, let me let me encourage you one thing that I read in the text just this morning. The Bible says that Job would sin for his children and pray. That means he didn't just pray for them. He prayed with them. They, they listen, they still went out and did what they did. But Job said, listen, when you get done, I need to see all y'all. So I can put my hands on you and pray. Young folks, our kids, our children, our young people, they're going to be young folks. But they need to know and hear you praying for them. They need to hear you calling their name before God in prayer. I know, listen, I'm just as guilty. I lift every one of my children up every morning in prayer. I call them by name. But I'm not as good as praying with them as I am praying for them. So my admonishment when I read that text is, Pastor, you don't just need to pray for your children. You need to pray with your children. Because they learn how to do what they see you do. I'm good. They listen. My boys know daddy's in his office. He got the door closed. Daddy's in there praying. They know that. But what would happen if I invite them? into my moment of prayer when I'm lifting up their names. What would happen if I invite them into my moment of prayer into the presence of God as parents and children before God in prayer? How powerful would, would that be? What, what kind of mark would that leave on their lives? We got work to do. It doesn't mean everything's going to turn out perfect. It just means that we're inviting God into the family experience. Yes. So church family, don't be so super spiritual that you can't pray with nobody else. Mm -hmm. Don't you be so holy that your prayers can only be heard by God and nobody else. Mm -hmm. Job sent for his family. He said, y'all come in here. Let me pray for y'all. That's our duty. That's our job. Pray, covering our family in prayer. Let's go to God and pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we have a high priest who always lives to intercede for us. That Jesus Christ is always praying for us. And Lord, we pray that you will spark in us a fire, a determination, a duty to not only cover our families in prayer, but to include our families in prayer. Yes. That we will be compelled, oh God, by the Holy Spirit to wrap our arms around each other, heart and heart, hand in hand, and spend time in prayer with one another. Yes. The world, oh God, has lost its mind. There are dangers everywhere. Satan is crouching at the door and so, Lord, before our families leave the house, we need to cover them in prayer. And Lord, right now, even though we are socially separated, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing that can separate us from each other. We are socially, physically separated, but we are spiritually connected. So we can still pick up the phone and pray for each other. We can still get on social media and pray for each other. We can still use technology to pray for each other. It is, it is imperative that we pray for one another because God family prays. Lord, if there's someone who's watching this who, who doesn't know you, who doesn't know how to pray, we stand in the gap for them today, oh God. We stand in the intercession for them today. We are crying out on their behalf because, Lord, they don't know the words to say. But, Lord, you said that if we confess with our mouth and believe with our hearts, we well shall be saved. You said that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You said that if we confess our sins, you are just and faithful to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, if there's someone today 
who doesn't know you in the pardoning of their sin, who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, have not surrendered their life to you. Lord, we lift them up to you right now. That on this first Sunday of a brand new year, they can say, I gave my heart to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you for still saving. Thank you for redemption. Lord, we thank you that you're still in the saving business. Father, thank you for covering us in prayer. Thank you for covering us last year. And Father, we thank you that this year, you're going to continue to do what you've always done. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Let every heart say, amen. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Uh, we are going to now move into our uh, Lord's Supper time. We are going to celebrate uh, the communion of the saints. This memorial supper where we embrace the reality that Jesus Christ has died on the cross. He has rose and he lives forever. We participate in the Lord's Supper so that we can all remember what he did for us and remember our responsibility to him. So wherever you are, grab your elements and wait and we'll eat all together as we read and pray and we'll distribute then we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Amen. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this root of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung to him, then went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's go to God and pray, Father. We thank you that you've given us this opportunity to remember the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not take this lightly, Lord. This is a solemn occasion of celebration. It is because of us that he died, but it is because of you that he rose again. So we say thank you today that you shed your blood, gave your life that we might live. Father, today if there's anyone who has anything that they feel as though will keep them from celebrating with us, Father, introduce them to the forgiveness of sin. Let them know none of us are worthy on our, own, on our own, but we've all been cleansed by Jesus Christ. And the only way, the only reason we are saved and the only way we can partake is because of what Christ has done for us. Consecrate us now, O oh Lord, that we may be found worthy in your sight because of Jesus Christ. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.
supper, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood that's been shed for you, the blood of a new covenant. Drink ye all of it. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Oh, Lord our God, how excellent is your holy name. You alone, O oh God, are awesome. You are alone, O oh God, are the only true God. So we thank you and we worship you for all that you've done. As we go into this new year, we pray that we will be holier, more consecrated, and focus more on you. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. The church said, amen, amen. Listen, uh, before we go, I want to thank everybody for joining us on this first uh, Sunday of the new year. Thank you for all that you did last year. Thank you for the blessings and the, the things that God has done in our church family. Thank you for those few who are here with us this morning. We're just grateful that you all could join us. We look forward to being a blessing. And we look forward to doing great things for God this year. We don't know what lies ahead. We don't know what 2021 holds for us, but we know who holds our future. And so we just want to be thankful and grateful and prayerful as we move forward. Our theme this year is we are family, and so we're going to be a family that leans, depends, loves, serves, gives, and praises the Lord God. So listen, uh, if you need us, we're here for you. Church doors have been temporarily closed. We're not doing all that we used to do, but we're still doing ministry. We're still loving on people. And we want to love on you. Amen. Amen. So let me let me pronounce a blessing over you before we leave. Now, as we leave this place, but never from your presence. Let the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us henceforth, now and forevermore. Let every heart say, Amen. God bless you. God keep you is our prayer.